Counterpoint, the general knowledge music quiz chaired by Ned Sherrin. Hello. Hello, welcome to the grand final of Counterpoint 2005, in which we're meeting again the three contestants who fought their way through heats and semi-finals to get this far. They've all proved they have formidable musical knowledge, but in half an hour's time, one of them will be proclaimed the 2005 Counterpoint champion and can look forward to a year-long whirlwind of supermarket openings and Hello! magazines. <laughs> I'll ask them to introduce themselves. I'm Brian Clements. I'm a mathematics lecturer now retired from Chelmsford in Essex. Chris Moore-Bridger, presently unemployed from Oswald Street in Shropshire. And I'm John Taylor, a semi-retired teacher from Lincoln. Congratulations on getting this far and welcome. Because we operate in a strictly alphabetical order, it's uh, Mr. Clements who goes first. Mr. Clements, only two characters sing in Bartok's opera, Duke Bluebeard's Castle. One is Bluebeard himself. The other one is one of his ill-fated wives. What is her name? Judith. Judith it is. Mr. Moore Bridger, here's part of an entertaining <coughs> and snappily named German orchestral work. When you've heard the extract, I'd like you to tell me which... Two composers are involved. Hindemith and Weber. Yes, it's uh, Paul Hindemith and Karl Maria von Weber. We heard the snappily titled Hindemith's Symphonic Metamorphoses on Themes by Karl Maria von Weber. Two points, Mr. Taylor. Which band leader directed the first performance of Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue at the Aeolian Hall in New York in 1924? Paul Whiteman. Paul Whiteman it was. Mr. Clements here is the resonant voice of a West African performer who's enjoyed success in collaboration with many Western popular musicians, including Peter Gabriel and Nena Cherry. This is from an acclaimed album he made in 2004 of traditional Islamic music. I wonder if you can name him. No, I can't name him. I can open it. If anybody can translate the lyric, that would probably earn a point. But no, it's Yusu Undur. Uh, very famous, and he we heard Allah from his most recent album, Egypt. Mr. Moore Bridger, which great Russian conductor directed his Kirov Opera Orchestra at a gala concert at the London Coliseum in November 2004, in aid of the victims of the Beslan School Massacre? Valery Gergev. Valery Gergev it was, broadcast it was on BBC Two. Mr. Taylor, um, Gergev was joined at that concert by the great Siberian baritone Dmitry Vorotsovsky for a performance of a grimly appropriate Russian song cycle. Here's part of their 1994 recording of the cycle, which is it and who wrote the music? Rachmaninoff? No. I can open it. Mr. Clements. The composer is Mussorgsky. Yes. And the song cycle is Songs of Death, I believe. Songs and Dances of Death, but I think you get your one point there. Thank you. Mr. Clements. <coughs> At the 2004 proms, the Silk Road World Music Ensemble gave three concerts. The ensemble was founded in 1998 to celebrate living traditions and musical voices throughout the world. Which cellist is the founder 
and the artistic director of that group. Uh, it's Yo-Yo Ma. It is Yo-Yo Ma. Mr. Moore Bridger, wonderful Hoagie Car <coughs> Michael song for you to listen to now in a rendition which was a surprise hit in the United Kingdom in 1976. The singer is a member of a prominent family of British popular musicians. Can you name him? You touch my fingertips and my heart is aglow You bend to kiss my lips and I can't let you go Maybe I should resist I'm a fool I know But at a time like this my resistance is low and the singer is what we're looking for. Um, Donny Osmond. <laughs> no, he's uh, very popular here, but not actually a British musician. So I can open it. Scratching of chins. No. Uh, Robin Sarstedt, his brothers Eden Kane and Peter Sarstedt also both enjoyed great chart success in the 1960s. Mr. Taylor. Bartolomeo Cristofori is credited with having built the first example of a musical instrument. His um, invention, uh, which he called the arpicimbalo, had a range of four octaves and was made for the Medici family in Florence at the very end of the 17th century. By what more familiar name do we know it today? The piano. <laughs> yes, indeed. Cristofori's achievement was to devise a hammer action capable of contrast in volume, hence the Italian name pianoforte, soft and loud. Mr. Clements, your turn again. And a piece of piano music for you to listen to. Its composer was born a few years before Cristofori had his great breakthrough. Can you name the composer? Nope, I can open it. Mr. Taylor first. Bach. No, uh, Mr. Bobridge, do you want to have a go? Um, Clementi. All three wrong. Handel, that was the oh. prelude from his suite number three. Um, Mr. Moorbridger, in the late 1960s, <coughs> a strange but persistent rumour grew among fans of the Beatles. One of the Fab Four had, in fact, died. Suspicion fueled by what was supposed to be veiled clues in the Beatles' song lyrics and on their record covers. Which member of the group was the subject of this myth? Um, Ringo Starr? Nope, I can open it, Mr. Clements. George Harrison. Nope, I can open it, Mr. <laughs> Lucky Mr. Taylor. Uh, who are you going for? Um, Paul McCartney. It was, in fact, <laughs> Paul McCartney. I suppose he gets a point. Most unfair, but I think he gets a point. Mr. Taylor, a piece of, piece of early 1980s pop music for you now, typical of the lush technique of a British record producer who came to dominate the music scene at the time. He oversaw successful records by, among others, the groups Frankie Goes to Hollywood and Yes, as well as the group you're about to hear. Can you please name this record producer? <laughs> One name escapes me. The other one I can think of is Berry Gordy. Nope. Anybody want to offer an alternative name? Trevor Horn. That was all of my heart from the LP The Lexicon of Love, which Trevor Horn produced in 1983 for the Sheffield group ABC. Mr. Clements. Which 1935 work by Alban Berg was dedicated to the memory of an angel? No, it's his violin concerto. It is indeed his violin concerto. Mr. Moore Bridger, in the autumn of 2004, the Royal Opera staged an operatic version of Nikos Kazantzakis' novel Christ Recrucified uh, with music by the Czech composer Martinu. What was the opera's title? 
the Greek passion. Greek passion was. And your final question in this round, Mr. Taylor, is this. In which great American musical do we hear the following lines? Our mothers all are junkies, our fathers all are drunks. Mm. Golly, Moses, naturally we're punks. <laughs> I do hope my interpretation didn't disturb you, Mr. <laughs> No, those aren't my forte, I'm afraid. I can open it. Mr. Mobridger. West Side Story. West Side Story. The lines come from G. Officer Krupke by the immortal Stephen Sondheim. Uh, at the end of round one, the scores are as follows. In third place, with five points, is Mr. John Taylor. In second and first place, joint, uh, with seven points, are Mr. Brian Clements and Mr. Moore Bridger. So we have a tie for first and second place between Mr. Clements and Mr. Moore Bridger, and we have to separate them before we get on to round two. So the first of them to buzz with an answer to this question will have the advantage. Who was the conductor who was the first husband of Cosima Wagner? Mr. Moore Bridger. Uh, Hans von Bülow. Just in time, I think. Save, save, save by the breath. So, round two is, um, is where each contestant has to choose one of four topics, which I'm about to give them, on which to answer their own specialist question. They have no prior knowledge of these categories, especially tonight. So this is always a happy surprise for our contestants, our leader so far. By virtue of the tie-break, Mr. Moore Bridger will have the first pick of the topics, followed by uh, Mr. Clements, who's uh, lying in second place, and finally by Mr. Taylor, who's in third. Today's choices are Tchaikovsky... Femme Fatales, Henry Mancini, and the Stately Homes of England. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moore Bridger, you're in the lead. Which of those topics would you like to answer on? Tchaikovsky. And what about you, Mr. Clements? No, Femme Fatale. And Mr. Taylor, that leaves for you Mancini and the Stately Homes. I'll go for the Stately Homes. The stately Homes, he goes for. Right, the lowest place the contestant goes first in this round, so just by a whisker, it's Mr. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Taylor, here come your individual questions on the Stately Homes of England in Noel Coward's Stately Homes of England. In what room are we informed that, although it makes you fear the worst, it was nevertheless used by Charles I quite informally, and later by George IV on the journey north? The loo? Yes, the lavatory. Yes. <laughs> Stately Homes of England, written for a 1938 musical called Operette. Uh, this gorgeous motet is believed to have been first performed at a stately home that no longer exists, namely Arundel House, the former residence of the Dukes of Norfolk on the north bank of the Thames near the Temple, where now stands an hotel. Can you tell me what it is called? Sorry. Yeah. It's Spem in Allium by Thomas oh. Tallis. The uh, motet for 40 Voices was commissioned by Thomas Howard, uh, Duke of Norfolk. Most of Rock's Pantheon have played at rock festivals based around a certain stately home in Hertfordshire. It's arguably become more famous as a concert venue than as a house. Which house is this? It's uh, Letchworth. No, it's Nebworth. Nebworth. <laughs> Uh, what name is given to the twelve anthems written by Handel between 1717 and 1718 for an aristocrat who lived at a residence called Canons in Middlesex? The Chandos anthems. Chandos an anthems indeed were commissioned by the Earl of Carnarvon, later the Duke of Chandos. Uh, the following jolly number is sung in the grounds of a fictional stately home. The song was added to the score for a new 1980s adaptation of a show that proved remarkably successful thanks partly to a new book by Stephen Fry. Can you name the show? The sun has got his hat on. Hip, 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 hooray. The sun has got his hat on and he's coming out today. Now we'll all be happy. Hip, 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 hooray. The sun has got his hat on and he's coming out today. He's been roasting peanuts. 
No, sorry. No. Me and my girl, Lupino Lane's big starring oh. vehicle before the war, and if we'd given you the Lambeth Walk, you'd probably <laughs> have been there, but that would have been too simple. Now, which uh, Britain opera is mostly set at a stately building called Bly? The Turn of the Screw. Turn of the Screw, yes. Now, here's a wonderful social comment on the idle rich from the point of view of the 1960s. Can you name the group performing it? The tax man's taken all my dough And left me in my stately home Blazing on a sunny afternoon And I can't sail my yacht He's taken everything I got All I've got this sunny afternoon And the group the Kinks. It is The Kinks, yes. Sunny Afternoon reached number one in the UK in 1966, written by Ray Davies, uh, Rock's very own equivalent of Noel Coward. Uh, <laughs> in which 2001 film with a score by Patrick Doyle did the popular interwar composer Ivan Novello appear as a character? Gosford Park. Yes, Novello was played by Jeremy Northam. The movie was directed by the great Robert Altman, the scripted by Julian Fellows. Unfortunately, um, Novello in the film was made to sing, which he never ever did after his voice broke. Uh, well, anyway, you got five in the first round, you got a very good ten in that, taking to a total of 15 points. <laughs> Mr. Clements, uh, you've chosen Femme Fatale. Um, in Bizet's opera Carmen, the heroine eventually chooses the bullfighter Escamillo uh, in preference to the soldier deserter who stayed with her for much of the action. Who is he? Jose. Don Jose, yes. Staying with French <coughs> opera, here's the biblical vamp oozing seductive desire but with decidedly mercenary intent. Who is she? Delilah. Here's Delilah from Samson and Delilah by Saint-Saëns. In 1968, Tom Jones had one of his most famous million-selling hits with the song Delilah. Can you name the highly successful songwriting team behind that particular number? Lieber and Stoller. <laughs> no, good guess. Uh, Les Reed and Barry Mason. British to the core. Uh, which of the symphonic poems of Camille Saint-Saëns is concerned with a certain queen of Lydia who compelled the great Hercules to work at a spinning wheel? Omphale's spinning wheel. Okay, with that? Yes, Leroy d'Omphale. Mm, yes. Yeah. Now, here's another would-be seductress who ultimately fails in her allotted task of seducing a young sporting hero. In which musical does she appear? Whatever Lola wants... Lola gets And little man Little Lola Wants you Make up your mind To have No regrets And the music is Damn Yankees Yes it is indeed That was a splendid uh, Gwen <coughs> Verdon from the original Broadway cast recording. Uh, in Tchaikovsky's ballet Swan Lake, what is the name of the double of the hero's beloved Odette, who is brought to the Act Three ball by the evil magician in an attempt to divert him from his true love? Cynthia. Odile. More from the musical theatre and operetta's own variation on seduction. In this piece, yet another femme fatale leads a poor soldier astray. She boasts of her charms in this famous song, Can You Name the Composer? Lehar or Strauss, so I'll say Strauss. 
Oh, you should have said Leha, Mr. Oh. Clemens. <laughs> it's from, uh, we heard Mein Lippens, the Gussen so Heiss, <coughs> from his last operetta, Judita, uh, dating from 1934. Leha sent a bound copy of the score to Mussolini. But Il Duce sent it back, saying that no Italian soldier would ever desert his post. <laughs> In Alban Berg's opera Lulu, the heroine takes on a string of lovers, including a painter and a lesbian countess. In the final scene, however, she meets her nemesis when she is murdered by which historical figure? Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper, yes, and that's your, your last question, your <coughs> eighth question. And you scored seven in the first round, ten also in that round, taking you to a score of 17 points. Uh, Tchaikovsky was your choice. What solo instrument is featured in Tchaikovsky's variations on a Rococo theme? The cello. Yes. This lively dance scene comes from one of Tchaikovsky's stage works. Can you tell me which piece it is? Eugene Onegin. Yes, yes, that's all we need, isn't it? It's the waltz, of course. Well, it's obviously a waltz uh, from Eugene Onegin. Uh, the musical instruction andante cantabile, meaning flowing and song-like, is often used by composers. However, the musical public most readily associates it with two of Tchaikovsky's most popular works, the second movement of the Fifth Symphony and the slow movement of one of his string quartets. Which string quartet is that? The first. String quartet number one in D, opus 11, yes. Tchaikovsky's trip to Italy in 1880 inspired the popular orchestral work known as the Capriccio Italien. What sort of military institution provided the idea for the fanfares which are heard at the beginning of the piece? Um, a naval recruiting parade. Oh, I don't think we can do that. No, no, no. no Mr. Kirkle is not impressed by that. <laughs> a barracks. But Tchaikovsky stayed in lodgings, quite uh, near yeah. one. Who knows why he stayed near a barracks, but there he was. <laughs> <laughs> Here is a part of, the work, of a work with which Tchaikovsky introduced himself to London audiences. Quite a nice calling card, I think you will agree, but can you put a name to it? Serenade for Strings. Yes, we heard part of the graceful second movement there. Tchaikovsky's last opera dates from 1891. What is it called? Mazeppa? Nope, Yolanta. Oh. Uh, Yolanta was first produced in a double bill with Tchaikovsky's ballet, The Nutcracker. They, they had longer attention spans in those days. <laughs> uh, which dance from Act Two of the ballet is featured here? Trepak. Trepak, or the Russian dance, mm. yes. Same with ballet for your final question. Which choreographer's ballet company, Adventures in Motion Pictures, was responsible for the famous initial production of Swan Lake in which the swans were danced by men? Well, the only choreographer of, I, I can think of is Marius Pepita. Matthew Bourne. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so... Uh, in third place, but only just, is Mr. John Taylor with 15 points. Both with 17 points are Mr. Clements and Mr. Moore Bridger. <laughs> so, we enter the final round where the whole thing is won or lost, where our contestants will get one point for a correct answer, but will lose a point if they fail to answer correctly. It's hands on buzzer, fingers poised, there are no bonuses. The composers, Poulenc, Auric, Onega, Talifer, 
uh, Mr. Taylor. Les Cis. Yes, well, the collective name bestowed on them by the critic only Colette in 1920 was Les Cis. Uh, what was the nickname of the jazz man Julian Adderley? <laughs> Mr. Clements. Cannonball. Cannonball, yes. Uh, orchestral excerpts from which German composers' operas are often described as bleeding chunks. Mr. Moorbridger. Wagner. Wagner, indeed. Who wrote the Symphonie Espagnole for the violin Sarasati, Mr. Moorbridger? Uh, Rimsky Horsakoff. Nope. Oh. Lalo lose one oh, point. Sorry. Which instrument, similar to an accordion, is Charles Wheatstone credited with inventing in 1825, Mr. Clements? Concertina. Concertina, yes. Uh, what is the nickname of Haydn's Symphony No. 100 in G major, Mr. Taylor? The military. The military it is. Which film introduced us to the Oscar-winning song The Windmills of Your Mind, Mr. Clements? The, the Thomas Crown Affair. Thomas Crown Affairs, right. Uh, which music hall star introduced the song One of the Ruins of Cromwell knocked over a bit, Mr. Clements? Um, Best of Tilly. No, it was Marie Lloyd's great song. Uh, which star of the Carry On films played Marie Lloyd in the wonderful West End show Sing a Rude Song? Mr. Taylor. Barbara Windsor. Barbara Windsor it was. Which song by Don McLean features the line Helter Skelter in the summer swelter, Mr. Taylor? American Pie. American Pie is right. Yes, well done. <laughs> What's the technical word for the plucking of violin strings, Mr. Taylor? Pizzicato. Pizzicato is correct. The art pop band The Kaiser Chiefs come from which Yorkshire city? No. Leeds. Uh, which Rogers and Hammerstein musical features the song I'm going to wash that man right, Mr. Moorbridger? South Pacific. South Pacific absolutely saves me from singing anymore. Mr. <laughs> Philip, Philip Glass wrote an opera which, about the troubled reign of which Egyptian pharaoh, Mr. Clements? Akhenaten. Akhenaten is right. And finally, complete Thomas Beecham's remark about the musical public. The English may not love music, but they absolutely, Mr. Taylor. Adore the noise it makes. Love the sound it makes. Love the noise it makes. Correct. Uh, you get your points for that. And that brings us to the end of the grand final of Counterpoint 2005. In third place, with a total of 18 points, is Mr. Moore Bridger. In second place, with 20 points, is Mr. Brian Clements. But by one point, our 2005 champion with 21 points is Mr. John Taylor. I think it was American Pie that did it. Congratulations to all our finalists, but especially to Mr. Taylor, who takes the laurel wreath as the 19th counterpoint champion. All our finalists receive a prize of CD vouchers, described in my script as generous, <laughs> with which they can perhaps plug some of those very scant gaps in their knowledge which this series might have exposed. Our thanks to our question setters for the series, David Kendrick and Stephen Follows. We'll be back with a new series of Counterpoint next year, our 20th anniversary. Anniversary, and we hope and trust you'll join us then. Until then, from our champion, uh, Mr. Taylor, and from everyone here at London's Drill Hall, goodbye. Thank you.